Okay, um, welcome everybody to this Zoom lecture hosted by the Center for the Study of Governance and Society here at King's. Um, my name is Mark Pennington and I'm the director of the center. One of the research topics that we've been exploring in the center over the last uh, two to three years has been to look at the role of social norms as governance mechanisms and the way in which those norms can facilitate bottom-up solutions to various collective action or public goods dilemmas, but also looking at the ways in which those social norms can lock in forms of behavior, which actually prevent solutions to collective action problems. Within that context, I'm delighted that we have with us today, Professor Christina Bicchieri. Christina is Professor of Social Thought and Comparative of Ethics at the University of Pennsylvania where she directs the program in philosophy, politics, and economics, and also the behavioral ethics lab. Christine is a world leading figure in the analysis of social norms, how they function, how they are sustained, and I think most importantly, perhaps, the challenges that face individuals and policymakers in trying to change uh, social norms for the good. Christine is going to speak for about 45 minutes to an hour. We're not going to take questions during the presentation, but we do invite you to write your questions in the various uh, chat boxes that are available in the Zoom format. We'll collate those questions and then put them to Christina in the Q&A session, which will take place for the final 30 to 45 minutes of the event today. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Professor Christina Bicchieri to speak to us about norms, norm nudging, and social influence. Christina, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, very happy to be here with you today. And uh, as I said, uh, if there are questions, uh, it would be nice uh, to leave them at the very end. Uh, and so, um, you know, uh, we can decide, uh, um, not me, probably Mark and uh, Irina, <laughs> which one uh, to highlight and which one to answer. Uh, okay, so uh, I will focus uh, on norm nudging, which is a very hot topic, uh, especially in public policy, uh, all over basically. England, of course, uh, the UK was a pioneer in this respect, uh, but uh, the US now it's, uh, you know, keeping track uh, and uh, not only local government, uh, um, the federal government, but also a lot of companies have behavioral units where they try uh, to use uh, norm nudging. Okay. So we all know what nudges are, you know, from the book of Taylor and Sunstein in 2008, the idea is they reframe the choice architecture to redirect behavior in a positive direction without forbidding options. And what is more important without changing economic incentives. Okay, so without positive or negative uh, sanctions. The common example, the most common example we, uh, we learn about at the beginning were examples of individual behavior like organ donation, how to convince people uh, to donate their organ, uh, let's say if they have a deadly accident, saving more in their pension plans or adhere to a medication schedule. And uh, these are, you know, uh, good examples, but uh, there is a peculiarity with this, uh, that all these uh, behavior are what I call socially independent. And I come for, uh, to that point in a minute. I want to look today at nudges that, uh, that work in a different way. So they don't work so much on some basic psychological biases, or not only on that, but they work on uh, through social comparison. For example, Holsworth did a very nice work alert alerting taxpayers that the majority pay their taxes on time. So you send a message 
And in the message, there is a comparison with other people that you know are very similar to you and they pay taxes on time. So what are you going to do? Driving feedback in Bogota was very, uh, very well known because uh, um, the mayor was Antanas Mokus, who was really creative and uh, the driving was terrible. The traffic was terrible. There were a lot of deaths in the city of Bogota. And so what he did, uh, he hired mime that uh, were mimicking uh, um, in a funny way, the behavior of the drivers and were giving the drivers a card with a green thumb up or a card with a red thumb down. And again, it was very public and visible message. And there was social comparison because I saw what other drivers had and they saw me. So it was, uh, it was very successful. So you can do uh, two ways of social comparison. One way you can inform people about what other people do, what are doing, what they do in a similar situation. And another type of social comparison is uh, let people know what others in the same situation approve or disapprove of. And the idea is uh, that these kind of messages, this kind of information will induce change in behavior. Now, what is the necessary assumption for norm nudging to work? Is uh, that the target behavior, the behavior you want to change, is or are interdependent. What does it mean? It means that the preference for performing this target behavior is conditional on the social expectation that people have. And let me move to that. So how do I define a norm nudge? So a norm nudge is a nudge I read from the slides whose mechanism of action relies, is based on eliciting social expectation with the goal of inducing behavior that is desirable, okay? Desirable in this case, nor nudging is not just for the individual, but for the community at large. Now, under the assumption, because you can do it uh, if you hold this uh, to be the case, in this the assumption that individual preference for performing the target behavior are conditional on social expectation or what I say, socially conditional. Okay, so if, uh, preferences for the target behavior are conditional on expectation is a good thing because we think that norm nudging by and large might be effective in changing behavior because you change or induce expectation, you change behavior. Now, what sort of expectation do we want to induce or change? What I call empirical expectation. So, I want uh, uh, to change or induce expectation about what you expect other people to do, okay? What is common behavior? And the normative expectation instead is a little different because it has a normative component, an odd component, if you will, that is, uh, what I want to change your expectation about what you expect others to approve or disapprove of. So what is common approval or disapproval? Now, what are the requirements, the basic requirement, and then we will discuss this further, for norm nudging to be effective? First of all, you have to identify precisely the mechanism through which different type of information affect behavior. How does empirical information affect behavior? How much? How does normative information affect behavior? How much? Should they be together? Should they be separate? And uh, if uh, they are separate but given at the same time, um, should be congruent or can they be incongruent? Okay. So we have to correctly identify all these mechanisms. And you have, first of all, to understand the motivation for specific behavior. 
For example, you want to change littering behavior. Well, it is very important to understand that if people litter just for convenience, and so if you put trash basing around, you know, they will be filled, or because other people litter, because they observe other people littering. So you have to know, you have to have an idea of about littering, recycling, uh, um, you know, um, electricity use, etc. is a different story because you don't see how much other people use. And so we need to send messages. But there are sort of lots of observable behaviors. And the question is, uh, if you want to change these uh, somewhat negative, uh, collectively negative observable behavior, okay, do you want to know what motivates this behavior first? Also, we have to understand the context in which the target behavior occurs. For example, in the new online classroom, which is a really new context for students, students may completely disregard information that they believe does not apply to the new situation. So for example, nudging to ask question in class, there is much less of that with online, even if with Zoom, you can raise uh, uh, your hand. Okay, so there are quite a few requirements. Now, where shall we start if we want to understand social behavior? Well, first of all, as I said, you have to understand in the littering example or recycling what motivates behavior. And what I do in all my work, I use a simple model of choice, uh, belief, first, second order beliefs and preference. And so I can measure and diagnose behavior, what it is. So what do I measure? Social expectation, empirical and normative, preference, whether they are conditional on expectations or not. And there are various ways to do that I will show you. Reference networks, why? Because uh, my expectations are about people that in some sense matter to my decision in that situation. So if I drive in London, my reference network are other drivers, the buses, uh, the uh, bicyclists, uh, the people who walk and cross the road. This is my reference network. In other circumstances, my reference network may be obviously very different. It depends on the situation, but we have to be very precise about what it is. I will show you. And uh, in the end, uh, we have to decide if the behavior is independent or interdependent. Okay. So these I already said. So conditional preferences are a crucial, crucial part uh, with uh, both social and descriptive norm. Because uh, we ask uh, whether expectation really matter to behavior. Do they have causal relevance? This is a crucial question we have to ask because you can have all the expectation in the world, but they don't have causal relevance. I always give the example of using an umbrella when it rains. You see it rains, you have to go out, you pick an umbrella. If I ask you, do you expect people to go around with an umbrella today? You will say, yes, I expect them to do that, of course. But is this expectation having any causal influence on your picking and choosing the umbrella? No. So your expectation is completely socially independent, socially independent. If expectations and the behavior, so expectation of causal relevance, uh, you know, you believe that if you change the expectation, the, be the behavior will change, okay? And another question, so we have to check the causality, okay? Do expectation have causal relevance or not? Another question we can ask is within this frame is, do some expectation matter more than others? For example, are empirical expectation more important in changing behavior than purely normative ones? I will show you later. Uh, but the important thing for no nudging is conditionality. If you assess that there is indeed conditionality, then norm nudging, ceteris paribus, may be successful. So the conditional preference I like to show this is the link between social expectation and behavior, okay? And the link may exist or may not exist. 
And it's very important to assess whether people have such conditional preference or not. So let me show you this, which is nice. So I divide behavior into four types. And vertically, you have on the right behavior that are interdependent. So the preferences are socially conditional. And on the left, we have independent behavior. Preferences are socially unconditional. Customs are a very common example of independent behavior. You prefer to use the umbrella because you believe it meets your needs. And even if we all use umbrella because we have this tool, if you will, uh, to meet a common need not to get wet. But our choice does not depend on other people using umbrella, doing it, or thinking that you should do it. Moral rules are very similar because generally you prefer to follow a moral rule because you think it's the right thing to do. Usually not is because other people do it. Think of not being willing to harm an innocent person. You think you should never do that. Fine. The fact that other people do and don't do it in normal circumstances or approve or disapprove of that doesn't have any effect on your choice not to do it. So again, very often moral rules are, uh, you know, socially independent, are followed because socially independent behavior. On the right, very important, we have conditional preference. And we can have two types of norms, what I call descriptive norms. A fashion is a descriptive norm. You prefer to wear certain shoes because you expect others, you know, maybe a TV personality or movie personality or the kids in your school, the, the, the cool kids, you know, do that. So your expectation is crucial in driving you to choose a certain behavior, in this case, buying shoes. So your choice depends on your empirical expectation. Convention are a form of descriptive norm, okay? Traffic conventions, you know, basically you do it because even if there were no fines, I would say, I always say, well, you would do it if there is a wide, widely share widespread convention you do it because uh, you don't want to spend time thinking oh my god you know is green for me but will others stop at the red or not you know you normally just uh, go social norms are a little more difficult in the sense that your preference is conditional both on the empirical expectation that most other people follow the rule but also on the normative expectation that they approve following the rule and disapprove transgressing the rule. And why with social norm, we have both the empirical and the normative together, because typically social norm exists in all situations where there is a social dilemma, there is a tension between your own selfish, if you will, welfare, and the welfare of the group. So we need to remind people <laughs> that we should behave prosocially. And so when we measure behavior, we have uh, two types of possible nudges. When we have independent behavior, a simple nudge might do, okay? Changing customs, you can nudge people to change their custom. But uh, the norm nudging only works in the, on the right side when behaviors are socially interdependent. This is very, very important to realize. So do we need different messages to change descriptive and social norms? Yes, think of Sweden when they went from left to right hand driving, you know, they needed repeated messages about, uh, you know, the rule has changed and people, and, and you know that other people are listening to the messages and you try to coordinate. Instead, you know, picking up after your dog, 
the kind of message you need uh, is different and there is a sort of normative message related to that you know you you think that maybe your neighbors uh, will criticize you okay i'm not saying sanction in a hard way but may criticize you if you do that so the kind of message may be different depending on the motivation behind these activities okay example of norm nudging okay uh, norm nudging as I said, is only useful when behavior are interdependent. And typical example of norm nudging is giving people empirical information, what other people do. And there are very good examples. Um, and here I give you uh, some uh, famous references about comparing electricity consumption to the neighbors, reduce consumption. Water consumption in California, Sion Bano did a very nice paper. He paired injunctive uh, uh, and uh, uh, empirical, successful, telling hotel guests that most other use unwashed towels, more guests reuse. Again, uh, this is an interesting example because there are different conditions and only some are really successful, but we can come to that late, uh, later. But the way you, you convey the message is crucial because a famous study by Schultz where you give people the average consumption of neighbors, uh, the people below average used more. The people above average decreased, but so there was no overall change. <laughs> because if you tell me that the average is X and I am below, I feel completely justified in raising to the occasion, i.e. to the average. Okay. Now, why empirical messages, therefore, can fail? One very important reason for failure is misunderstanding the reference network, okay? There is a very nice example of good understanding of reference network. It's a paper by Holsworth, 2016. He informed that over-prescribing general practitioners over prescribing antibiotics, that they prescribe more than 80% of the other doctors, GPs in their area. And this reduced antibiotic prescription. Again, he didn't say GP in London, that is Scotland, they prescribe less antibiotics because I may think, okay, in Scotland, maybe, you know, there is better quality of air. They don't get all the diseases we get in London. No, you have to have a reference network that is exactly the one that people can identify with, okay? Not doing that uh, will induce self-serving interpretation like London versus Scotland. Well, in Scotland, you know, they are healthier, therefore I can continue prescribe the number of antibiotics that I do now. The messenger may not be trusted or credible, and we will see that uh, um, later on with an example, if I have time to go to that. And uh, people tend to reject information that is inconsistent with their beliefs. So we have to be very careful about that. Now, going to normative messages, whether they are effective or not, just sending a pure normative message is not clear. So sometimes these messages were effective, water conservation. Uh, Cialdini has a famous example where he gives a positive normative message and there is a negative uh, uh, sort of uh, descriptive information. It's not a message, it's a, a littered environment. And the positive message uh, uh, about littering had that positive effect. And Bano paper, he had normative uh, information to empirical when it was effective. Now, of course, you don't know, we don't know how long the effectiveness lasts because we don't have longitudinal studies. So we may say that in the short run, there is a change of behavior, but whether this change is sustainable, it lasts or not, we don't know. Okay. Another very, very important thing that we saw with COVID-19 media examples, when normative and empirical message are incongruent, 
the negative empirical information can win over the positive normative one. So you get, uh, uh, you know, uh, important normative information about what is important to do, what you should do, but then you see that so many people have been fined, so many people are shown going around without mask and uh, uh, not socially uh, distant, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you you get incongruent messages, and usually when the messages are incongruent, we tend to favor whatever we prefer, and often is the empirical negative one. Okay. Another reason why normative messages alone, especially moralizing messages, not so much messages about what other approve or disapprove of, but you know, messages that say the right thing to do is, uh, generally people tend to infer that most people don't do that. If you have to tell me that the right thing to do, the appropriate thing to do is X, Y, Z, I normally infer that most people don't do that. So this is very important to keep in mind. So how does not nudging backfire? Information may allow what Jason Dana called the, the moral wiggle room, okay? Uh, what does it mean? Is example of the Scottish and the London patients. I am a GP, yeah. Maybe they use a, a much less antibiotic prescription in Scotland. You know, but I am not going to change. So I find a reason why there is this difference. Uh, also, this is very important. Mentioning that many people engage in behavior that is socially harmful can normalize it. Corruption campaigns are a terrible example of that. They uh, make people know the high frequency of bribing, kickback, corruption. This normalizes it. And so people will be driven uh, towards that behavior. And uh, last but not least, uh, we make a lot of asymmetric inferences from different type of information. So when negative behavior is uh, very common, the corruption campaign example, these usually imply people infer that it is sort of approved, accepted. So they infer uh, a normative message behind that, which is not that good. Also, disapproval of negative behavior, if I just send you a message saying most people disapprove of, will it imply that they don't do it? Not at all. People don't infer that. I will show you uh, later with experiments. And when empirical and normative information are in conflict, then Usually, I, I showed that many years ago in a paper with Ertek Xiao, the empirical is more powerful than the normative. Okay. Now, I want to talk about uh, uh, some interesting results. One is a paper I did uh, with Diemant and Sonderegger, and uh, it shows that individuals tend to choose self beliefs more often the empirical rather than normative information. Why? Let me show you what we did. The goal is to understand how people use information, either empirical or normative, to form beliefs about whether a norm applies. And we want to know how belief formation is affected by the source of uncertainty, okay? So our experimental design is a modification of the die under the cup paradigm. So what, what, what is the, the uh, die under the cup paradigm? Basically, um, I experimenter, I don't see what you do. I only see what you tell me. Uh, uh, you toss a die, if the number five comes up, you know, you get a monetary rewards. If any other number comes up, you get nothing. And, uh, but before, you do this, uh, um, this little uh, game, if you will. I, um, I give you some information and you have to choose about uh, uh, an uncertain state of the world. So I can, uh, and I divide people into two groups. The empirical information group, I tell you in the previous experiment, 
uh, I give you these two sentences. The first sentence is most people lie, to, you know, uh, for their benefit. And the other sentence is most people did not lie for their own benefit. Please choose, you know, which is the true one because we have the data. And if you choose the true one, you get a monetary prize. The other group were uh, given a choice between two normative statement in the previous uh, identical game. Most people approved of lying for one own benefit. And the other sentence is most people did not approve. And please, you know, let me know which one you believe is true, guess, and if you are correct, you will get uh, a monetary prize. What we vary between these groups is whether participants know that they themselves will play the game afterwards or not. And look at this result. The important thing is to look at this. If you know that you subsequently will play the dice game, 62%, almost 63% say, no, no, the right, the right, the true sentence is the majority lies. In the previous game, you know, we believe that the majority lied. Those people who don't know they will play the game afterwards, they think the experiment ends here, only 47% believe that the majority lied. So this is a minority, this is a significant majority. And these are the people that are given the empirical statement. They have to choose which one is true. Look at the right side. There is basically no difference. So people who know that uh, here, these people here, the 38.5%, they know that they will have to play the game and they could cheat. But their assessment of the majority approve of lying, they do not believe that the majority approve of lying. And even those that don't know, they will have to play the game afterwards, think the same. So here, the majority of our subjects, whether they know they play the game afterward or not, think that the majority does not approve of lying. But here, most people think that the majority lies, and most people here think the majority really doesn't lie. So why this huge difference? Okay. And so we followed up uh, with a survey with two variations. We give empirical information and see what sort of normative expectation people infer from it. And another group gets normative information and we elicit their empirical expectation. And the first is, the first group received the majority of participants in this game did not lie for their own benefit. How many approved of lying? And if the majority did not lying, okay, very few are believed to approve of lying. So if the empirical, the, the, uh, the data I give you is empirical, then most people did not lie. Most people okay, did not approve of lying is uh, the violet, okay? So the empirical information leads to a very strong normative assessment, normative inference. Look here instead. Here I give you, I tell you, the majority disapproves of lying. Now, how many people do you think did lie? And it's 50-50, okay? And this explains this result that if I give you the normative statement, it doesn't matter that if you say, yeah, the majority, you know, uh, disapproves because this is the majority approved is 38%. So the rest, uh, you know, is uh, the majority disapprove of lying. So if the majority disapprove of lying, doesn't mean that people don't lie. If these people lie, uh, they must also approve of that. Okay. 
So to follow through with that, I did several experiments on norm inference. So norm inference is the reasoning process in which an individual derives the information either about a social group common behavior or about this group normative beliefs from a representation of the group normative beliefs or behavior is the norm message that we send. And we show several things. We don't have that much time, so I want to go on uh, the experiment. So I use a two by two uh, uh, factorial between subject design and randomize the order of 23 different behavior. And you may receive empirical or normative information. And the information may be about empirical bad behavior or empirical good behavior or normative approval of bad behavior versus approval of uh, bad behavior, okay? And the behavior was selected from uh, uh, very well-known recent behavioral change studies that use norm nudging, including dishonest behavior, prosocial behavior, environmental behavior, et cetera. And participants were presented with a vignette uh, narrative that said, now we enter a world travel machine. We land in a city that's randomly selected by our system. And you receive information about what res most residents are doing versus you know, thinking in this city. Tell us what you infer from the information about what in fact most citizens do or think is appropriate, depending if you receive an empirical or a normative message. And there is, I give you a slider, from zero to 100%, uh, zero means uh, uh, no one in the city does or approve, depending on the question, 100%, everybody does. And uh, one example is speed driving. And so uh, we have four different groups and uh, one received the empirical positive in this new city, most residents drive below the speed limit how many do you think say it is appropriate to drive below? And there is uh, the normative, most residents say it's appropriate, how many you know, follow through, empirical negative, most drive above, how many think is appropriate to drive above, and negative, most residents say it's appropriate to drive above, and um, how many do you think drive above? So you have empirical positive, normative positive, empirical negative, normative negative. What are the results? First of all, uh, these are the norm inference rating. To the left, you have the positive behaviors, and to the right, you have the negative behavior. And uh, what you see is that there is a, it is a box plot. There is a much higher variance in inference rating from negative behavior than from positive behavior. That's really interesting. And people overall have a high inference rating in the positive condition rather than in the negative condition across behavioral domains. So this is very important. But the most important is this one. The norm valence, I the valence of behavior, positive or negative, moderates the effect of the type of information on the inference rating. Look at the positive condition, sorry. Look at the positive behavior, okay? The estimated norm inference rating for empirical is seven, is almost 8% percent, percent, sorry, percentage higher than from the normative information. Okay, so what you infer in the positive condition from the empirical information is much stronger than what you infer from the normative information. The opposite is true for negative behavior. Here, the norm inference rating from empirical is four percentage lower than from the normative. So from the empirical here, negative, you infer that they approve of the behavior. And here you, you infer that uh, uh, you know, they do the behavior. It's very interesting. 
So the valence has, and here are other examples of behavior. So cheating, uh, um, you know, in homework, cutting in line, um, tax evasion, littering, all show the same pattern, okay? However, there are outliers. For example, one interesting example is bribing uh, the officer, the admission officer at a university, it happened in the US, in order for your child to be admitted. Here is sexual harassment, vaccination, and jaywalking. Now, why do we have uh, these outliers, these differences? Um, before coming to that, uh, I want to, uh, well, let, let me do that. Um, because uh, the pattern of norm inference is dependent on the context, okay? What happens when the behavior like uh, bribing public uh, uh, admission officers, uh, bribing, sorry, admission officers in university, public or private, you know, has a different pattern. Uh, we can explain the outliers depending on how observable the behavior is, how frequent can it be, and how much respondent agree. With vaccination, there is a huge disagreement, and this explains why there is an outlier. And uh, in the example, for example, uh, for example, of bribing uh, to get your child into college is interesting. Even if I give you the sentence, most people believe it is permissible, it is acceptable to do that. Uh, people don't infer that it is uh, that common. Why? Because the commonness is conditional on the frequency of people who are able, how many people are able to pay. And, uh, you know, you know that they pay half a million <laughs> and therefore there are very few people able to pay. And so the inference will be a little skewed, a little difference, okay? So the respondent might infer from a normative information that people approve of bribing college officials, they still infer that is not common, okay? Because of that. And to conclude what we found, we found a double asymmetry in the norm inference that people make. This is very important to keep in mind when you do norm nudging. Empirical information about positive behavior leads to a parallel normative inference. Yes, they approve it. Normative information about negative behavior, people approve of bribing, leads to a parallel empirical inference then people, most people do bribe. So this evidence support the mental association that has been uh, discussed in several paper, Erickson et al is an important one, in which they say people associate common with moral. I wouldn't use the word moral as a philosopher, I would use appropriate, you know, uh, acceptable. Now, our finding about these asymmetric inferences suggests that the direction and strength of the association can be modulated by the valence of the behavior. So if you send, if you do norm nudging and you send information about negative behavior, hoping that people will do the opposite is not a good idea. Okay, the valence of the behavior moderates the effect, okay? And when the behavior is positive, people follow a common is moral heuristic when making inference, as I said, when is negative, the strength of the bidirectional mental association between common and moral is reverse, and individual infer that other behave in a negative way from their normative, you know, attitude. Uh, now, I want to say something very briefly about the study we did about compliance with the public health rules during the COVID pandemic. And of course, we know the government cannot rely on coercive power to ensure compliance. And one driver could be newly emerging social norm. And so norm nudging through empirical and normative expectation may be very, very successful, okay? 
And uh, we ask that question and we ask also if this effect, uh, this is a public health issue. So is it that science has an important role to play? Is uh, the normalizing effect moderated by trust either in government or science or both? We did a survey in nine countries, China, Colombia, Germany, Italy, Mexico, South Korea, Spain, UK and United States and uh, the paper is uh, uh, not yet published, but uh, is online. And uh, what we did, uh, we uh, subject people to a vignette to ask the important question, is the behavior conditional on expectation? And uh, of course, different groups receive different vignettes. But the vignette says somebody like you lives in a very similar country affected by COVID-19. One vignette may say, most residents are practicing social distancing, staying at home, and most residents believe that one should practice social distancing, staying at home. So positive empirical, positive negative. Few residents uh, you know, do that, and few believe it should be done, negative, negative. And then we have intermediate case. Most do, but few believe one should, be, uh, one should do that, or Few do, but most believe one should do it. So we have all the four possible combinations. And when we ask how likely is that the person in the vignette will comply with social distancing, um, social distancing and staying home, we get the similar uh, super high, uh, more than 98% correlation. So I'm using only one here. Uh, how likely it is, and those with high empirical and high normative, the scale is one to 10, have a very high scale, 7.57, and those with a low expectation is much lower. And high, low, and low, high is intermediate, okay? The same with social distancing. So the interesting thing is, if you induce high empirical and high normative expectation, people will think that compliance is going to be likely, okay? So norm nudging that want to induce both these high expectation should be successful, right? And look at the result with social distancing, high, high, I, I only compare high, high and low, low, uh, you know, in this case, high, high is, uh, is huge in the vignette and um, you know, we wanted to do a robustness check. And so we look also at their self-reported social distancing. And this is before lockdown and after lockdown. And the results are relatively similar in the sense those with high expectation comply much more after the lockdown, even higher. But so there is a similarity between the self-reported and the vignette response. Now, what is the mechanism behind the strong connection between compliance and expectation? So if we do norm nudging and create high expectation, is this sufficient to guarantee a consistent and high level of compliance? And uh, the answer is not so fast. What we also measured was trust in government and in science. In this case of pandemic public health, it's very important uh, not only to trust the government, one thing, but also to trust scientists and science. And we measure trust on a scale from one to four. And overall, with the exception of China, respondents tend to trust scientists more than government, with the highest average trust in scientists in Spain and the lowest, unfortunately, in the US. And you see the results. Now, the highest average trust in government uh, occurs in Germany, the lowest in Mexico. And uh, for many of our analysis, we compare people with high trust with low trust people. And this is a very interesting result. So here we have all the people with both empirical and high normative, uh, high empirical, high normative expectation. But we see that for those people, these are all people with high normative and empirical expectation, 
and the behavior is social distancing, the trust in sciences. So this is low trust in science, the orange, and uh, the cream greenish is high trust in science. And you see that trust in science with the same level of high expectation maximizes compliance, okay? Now, when expectations are high and trust in science is high, trust in government really is marginal. So what matters is that, that people trust science, okay? So if people do not trust science, the norm nudging may not be that effective. This is very important. Look, this is low trust in science versus high trust in science. You just look at one of them. There is a huge difference, okay? So it's very important to metabolize this information and understand that norm nudging, you know, also requires to function and especially in public policy, uh, health policy issues, you know, trusting the messenger, okay? In this case, uh, trusting the scientist. So what are the general conclusions we may draw from this? And uh, I finish now, is uh, that uh, we have to pay attention to interdependent behavior and being able to measure when it is or is not interdependent. The norm nudging can be effective when behavior are interdependent, i.e. are conditional on empirical or normative expectation and therefore information. But effectiveness can depend on several things. Avoiding uncertainty, okay? Avoiding uh, uh, putting people in a moral wiggle room, choosing the appropriate reference network, so illicit identification like Holsworth did with GP in the same area. Using trusted messages. So if the government and the scientists are, are at odds, as it happened in the US and Brazil, for example, uh, then uh, trust in science is diminished. And this is a very, very uh, harmful to norm nudging. Even if norm nudging were successful, there would be room for opportunistic behavior. We can discuss that. We have to give public examples of positive behavior, and we always have to, to consider the asymmetry between empirical and normative information. So when we give information, the valence matters. Is behavior positive or negative? We know that if we show how common is negative behavior, uh, people infer that it is approved. If uh, we show disapproval of negative behavior, people don't infer that then the good behavior is common. And uh, giving conflicting empirical and normative information can lead to the empirical being more powerful. And here I close and stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box and I'll read them out loud. So we have a question um, from Elisa Cavatorta. Do norm nudges that leverage changes in beliefs work equally well when trying to encourage a desirable action to do X as opposed to trying to dissuade an action not to do X? I think uh, that uh, uh, if you want, uh, um, uh, is better to encourage than to dissuade. Uh, I think uh, is much better. That this is an important question because often we cannot tell lies to people, okay? Especially when behavior is rather observable. But what we can do is focus on areas of desirable behavior and show the advantages of that for the people uh, you know, who behave in such a way. I think this is very important. Uh, I work with that on sanitation in, in, in India and it does work, okay? So uh, do they work equally well when trying to encourage uh, as opposed to trying to dissuade? I think encouraging is better 
than dissuading. But of course, then, uh, you know, it depends uh, again on uh, uh, what people independently know, what people independently believe, etc. But I would say that the first that is more important. <laughs> I like the second, who nudges the nudgers? Oh, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll read this out loud in case um, we have listened. Uh, okay, one classic conjecture is who nudges the nudgers, or in this case, who norm nudges uh, the norm nudgers? <laughs> so who, who, who nudges them? Who induces them uh, to do what they do? Uh, so do you think society can change the social expectation of the nudgers themselves? Uh, in order to get better natural outcomes. Well, uh, what usually happens is, uh, let's think of public policies that uh, uh, the policymakers really uh, try to nudge with some idea uh, in their mind about what the appropriate pro-social behavior is. And this is very, very important. One connected question to this question is, Oh, but nudging is a very paternalistic way of, uh, uh, you know, approaching people. And uh, I don't agree completely um, because uh, I think that people always have reasons to choose one behavior over another, okay? And uh, what nudging does, uh, is giving people certain reasons because uh, we believe uh, that uh, they are motivated, you know, but other people behavior, etc. And uh, so I think if you don't lie, because I'm assuming we're telling the truth, and this is absolutely important, especially with norm nudging, we're telling the truth. And so in this case, uh, I think uh, we are we are giving people good reasons to change behavior. So who control the nudgers is basically what we believe as public policy makers, what is the most pro-social behavior, basically. We may be wrong, <laughs> but in all sincerity, this is what we believe. Fumagalli. So the question is, defining and demarcating the relevant reference networks is often a critical precondition for designing and implementing effective norm nudges in non-laboratory settings. Could you please expand on how policymakers should define reference networks in non-laboratory settings and how they should test competing assumptions concerning reference networks in such settings? Uh, for instance, membership versus non-membership, robustness of membership to contextual changes, et cetera. Yeah, the, this is all done with network analysis. Basically, I do a lot of applied studies and uh, uh, in my group, uh, we have people who specialize in network analysis. Now, network analysis, you can think of any possible networks that a person can belong to, okay? But I give you an example very specific with, uh, we, I work with the Gates Foundation in India about, uh, uh, building, uh, uh, maintaining, and using toilets. Because building is one thing, but then you have to use and maintain them. And uh, uh, the question about the reference network, uh, there are different reference network when you need the money, who you talk to, okay? Uh, when you need to repair or build, whom do you trust? Whom do you discuss it with, et cetera, et cetera. And so we look at all these different reference network. And what I can, can tell you from my experience is, uh, that uh, uh, different type of behavior, all related to sanitation in that case, uh, basically uh, involve different reference network. And you have to be very clear about that. For example, my stupid initial expectation was neighbors in the sense spatially close people matter. They don't unless the neighbors are family and close friends, for example. Okay, so you do network analysis and you know, depending on what you are studying, the behavior you are studying, there will be possibly different networks that are important. Okay, perfect. Um, next question, how does cultural difference or different age groups affect these results in this study? Important, okay. 
uh, well, is, uh, is related to the reference network. Oh, I'll give you an example. The first messages uh, that we received about COVID-19 were, were about uh, who will be really suffering from it. Old people, people with pre-existing disease and so on and so forth. And so what a young person who listened to this message will say, I'm not old, I don't have pre-existing disease, so I'm safe, okay? So uh, there were, uh, basically there was no idea of targeting the message to the audience. And for example, what they did on Instagram, uh, you could have a tag that tells, I stay home. Young people did that mostly. And uh, so it was, it became very public. Uh, who was staying home was uh, happy to stay home, you know, uh, was uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, happy to show that they stay home and so on and so forth. So it's very important to be clear about who the reference network is. We know, for example, that women are much more compliant. Uh, we we are, have another paper out of this analysis, of this study. Women are more compliant than men. Uh, people with higher level of instruction are more compliant, maybe because their trust in science is higher usually. Okay, so there are different uh, differences among groups and cultural differences, of course, can pay, play a huge difference. In China, trust in government in science is super high. Okay, why? I don't know, but you know, they respond you know, the response is very high. So yes, there are differences, of course. You have to take them into consideration when you work in a specific reality. Sharmila? Great, um, next question from Sharmila. Uh, have you asked questions about trust in government or science if they talk about facts and scientific evidence as a group or as individuals? Because we have seen that people here in Brazil tend to believe when scientists talk about scientific evidence, as biomedical collectives rather than isolated scientists being interviewed because what we have seen is that when politicians that disagree with whatever scientific evidence they tend to find counter narrative facts that might be false or that are most certainly false to say that this scientist is a fake um thanks in advance and thanks for such a brilliant and thought-provoking talk um okay um we use um, we have a lot of different questions about trust in this paper we just focus uh, trust in science in the sense of scientists, what scientists officially say and trust in government, okay? Now, um, talk about fast scientific evidence as a group or as uh, individuals. Uh, I think uh, um, there is another question that we ask and that uh, I, I didn't put in, and is also trust in doctors. And trust in doctors is very high. And also trust in science is enormously higher than trust in government across countries, okay? Very important, across countries on average, I'm talking of average, not outliers, trust in science is typically higher than trust in government and trust in doctors because people think of their own doctor is uh, the highest, okay? Then, of course, they trust family, etc. But uh, yeah, we didn't care about that. Okay. And so we have, you say, you have seen in Brazil, uh, they tend to believe in scientific, about scientific evidence uh, as collectives uh, rather than isolated scientists. This is a very interesting question because sometimes. Uh, you know, is more convincing if it is a collective, okay, message. So uh, virologists believe that, okay. The problem with COVID has been that the science is in the making, okay. They are learning more as time goes by. And, uh, and so it's not that scientists say really different things, but maybe, or opposing things, but maybe say something differently. And this may be confusing. So Sharmila, I think that your question is very good. It's much better to have the scientists as a group saying ABC 
than one scientist saying one thing and the other scientist saying something maybe a little different. Uh, it may, be, may make it less credible, especially when the government is against the scientists. Perfect. Uh, we have a question in the chat box from Dimitri. Um, it seems there is a critical stage on the way from a norm nudge to a choice or action, which is taken under influence from this nudge. This stage is the moment when, per when the person gets the message and reflects on it. The person may think very hard about the message and even agree with its implications, but still not change the course of his or her actions. What makes a person not only pay attention to the message, but also change the course of his or her actions? Well, that's a, a basic important question about what motivates that. These are all the experiments I do in the field and in the lab. You know, you have to have an idea of uh, what motivates people to behave one way or another. Because if my motivation is moral, or uh, is socially independent, the fact that you nudge me telling me what other people do, etc., you know, I may think, yeah, they do that. But no, uh, you know, I have a, a different conviction. Okay, and it's very interesting what you say, because when we do vignettes, vignettes in the field, you know, I cannot manipulate the variables as I do in the lab. In the field, I have to do these vignettes and uh, you know, there are different combination of expectation. And what I want to see on average is, do people think that this fictitious character in the vignette, I don't ask you because uh, there are demand effects there, you know, will change behavior or not? So, this lets me know if there is a social interdependence or not. This is very important. In the COVID-19 example, I show, we show actually, not just me, we are a group of people, that there is a social interdependence, okay? This is very important. And the question is, is this interdependence moderated by trust in science? And the answer is yes. Okay, so the answer to your question is, uh, uh, you do uh, you do lot of experiments, we do a lot of RCTs, et cetera, exactly to know whether there is a causal effect or not. And when you do norm nudging, the problem with norm nudging not working is very often you do it not knowing really, not having any idea of what motivates people. So I suggest one should do some pilot to see if it is the case that uh, these behavior are socially interdependent. Perfect. Um, thanks so much, Christina. We don't have any more qu questions as of yet. So if you still have any questions, go ahead and type them in. Um, Mark, do you have any questions? Um, I, I had a question again on the, um, the, the COVID example and the, and the role of science. Yeah. So let's assume that there is some trust in science in terms of people believing what the scientists say about the progression of the disease, the nature of the disease, those sorts of things. It strikes me one of the problems has been the disagreements there are about the trade-offs between science and other, other factors. So presumably there's going to be a lot of uncertainty about people's expectations about how other people view those trade-offs. That would seem to me to be a, a key factor in affecting whether or not people are willing to comply with the various regulations and how long they're willing to do that. Is there anything in what you've been looking at that will get at that aspect of it? Uh, yeah, um, we also measure uh, the perception of risk, the optimist bias. We have lots of measure, okay? This paper, uh, if we had a paper with all the stuff <laughs> would be a hundred page long. <laughs> So we decided to divide it into several papers. So we just look and ask a question, trust in science moderates the effect of nudging very high expectation. Yes, it does, because there is free riding basically, mm. okay? Because what happens? Suppose that you don't trust very much what scientists say. Uh, you start believing it's like a flu, but you also, 
have very high normative and empirical expectation that people comply with the rules, then you free ride. Mm. It makes full sense to free ride because it lowers your risk perception. This is very important. So when you think of trade-off, uh, well, an important component is how much risk you perceive you have. Because in a normal situation, there could be a certain trade-off between A and B, but if it's a very risky situation, everything changes. So uh, I think risk perception and also optimism, because we measure optimistic beliefs, okay? Optimistic belief is uh, it won't happen to me. <laughs> A lot of young people think that mm -hmm. versus it won't happen to my family, okay? Or, you know, uh, it's easy to survive, etc., etc. So we measure all that too. And they have an effect. So to answer your question, yes, there are other components that are important. Thanks so much. I think we haven't received any new questions. Um, so we'll give people one last chance to type some in. We have all that. Yep. I think there's another one that's good. Oh, another one. Uh, uh, yes. Um, the effects of nudges have been reportedly short term. What's your view on this? And is it too much to ask for nudges to have a lasting impact? Well, uh, yes. Uh, if you want uh, uh, to change uh, behavior um, and make it very prosocial, okay? So think of global warming and changing people's behavior in the direction of diminishing global warming. Their trust in science, I think, is very, very important. Uh, of course, uh, you would want uh, the effects uh, to be long lasting. This is a, a question that is not just related to norm nudging, but any intervention that we do in the field, be it sanitation, child marriage, this or that, you want to induce uh, new norms, okay? New norms of behavior. And the important question is, uh, we know sometimes successful is short-lived. That's why, now I didn't discuss that, but I always do these big surveys about what people expect, uh, their personal normative beliefs, their normative expectations, their factual beliefs, all of that. And uh, I decide uh, what sort of intervention, or we decide what sort of intervention is more adequate. We do our CTs. The interesting thing, if something doesn't work, it is very important to have this type of survey because we repeat the survey and we see if something has changed or not, okay? For example, in Pakistan, there was uh, this huge slippage about open defecation. They stopped it for a while and then, <laughs> you know, it went back with a vengeance. And uh, we did, uh, we were not involved in the first part. Okay, so we did the survey, it was afterwards. But what we saw is that the normative expectations were very low. Yeah, people are changing their behavior, but you know, approval, disapproval is not relevant. Dang, they go back to authentication. So you have to be able to do surveys that can be conducted longitudinally to see if there is no change or if there is change and then there is a decay, basically, what is the reason? Nobody does usually longitudinal changes, uh, longitudinal analysis, also because grants last two or three years. <laughs> and you need, no, it's true. <laughs> and uh, you need to go on to see, you know, what's going on and why it's not going on as expected. So this is a big thing, a big problem. Yes, we're very well aware of that um, in the <laughs> world of <laughs> research centers and grants. Um, yeah. Another question, how do you nudge people about COVID-19 when politicians use COVID as a political instrument? It's very interesting uh, because I heard from some people the belief 
uh, that all these measures uh, are really a political tool. <laughs> and, uh, it's interesting because my response is, okay, uh, is a very dangerous tool <laughs> because the economy is going down the drain. <laughs> okay, so uh, a tool up to a point. Uh, I think uh, uh, I think you have to understand that when people say it's a political tool, what they mean. Okay, some people say because the government, I heard that in Italy, want to control us more. Okay, and uh, my answer is okay, suppose they want to control you more, but the problem is, uh, you know, the economy is going down the drain. So is this what the government want, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I would make people think about uh, what the possible goals of the government would be vis-a-vis -vis the enormous damages that reflect on that government too. So uh, the political advantage, I really don't see that. All right, uh, thanks so much. Don't see any new questions coming in. Um, we'll give it another minute or so. I remember one more from George. Oh, sorry, I missed that. Um, so in the case of the vaccine uptake, does the consensus count as a normative nudge? And how can we negate the impact of false news when designing behavioral interventions in light of this? This is a crucial, crucial question, because uh, uh, I don't know if you notice, uh, when I look at uh, the inferences and the outliers, the vaccine is an outlier. <laughs> Okay, because there is a huge polarization in the population between pro uh, and anti-vax. So this is a very interesting question. And uh, uh, I have been asked that before. And, uh, you know, to all the optimistic people that say, oh, we have vaccine, fantastic, then uh, it will disappear. Uh, my answer is, well, provided that people get vaccinations. And so the big question I think here will be, how do we nudge people to vaccinate? And uh, probably the best example uh, would be showing uh, that uh, it is effective and not dangerous. I think people are really scared about the no vax people are all scared about the terrible effects of vaccine, et cetera. And I think a lot of people will be sort of scared of uh, the vaccination also because normally it takes uh, years to produce a vaccine and now it's been produced very quickly. And so I think it will be a very, very difficult uh, thing to do, nudging people to, to get vaccination. So I wouldn't be so triumphant saying now we have a vaccine when we need the people who vaccinate. And I'm not sure that it will be an easy step. Fantastic. Um, we have another question. How do you do norm nudging in an environment where fake news and conspiracy theories are plenty? <laughs> Fantastic question. Not only there are fake news, but there is polarization. Because uh, we, we are all biased. Uh, it's called confirmation bias. I have certain beliefs. I don't go around falsifying them. I want to confirm them all of us the same, okay? We usually, some people are more reflexive than others, but usually we look for confirmation. And so uh, think of the Novax people, we gave, just gave this example, they can find on the internet all sorts of information, even uh, uh, information that looks like a medical journal, etc., cetera, uh, that looks like a legitimate information, uh, that is fake, okay? And the interesting thing is that these people, since it confirms what they want to believe, they accept it as truthful. So the important question, uh, I had this question asked some other day, uh, and the person was asking, what about having a, a like, uh, 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 almost a supranational entity that checks information 
And, uh, and the problem is that then you would have to control Facebook. You have to control Google. You have to control all these sources of information that we use and say, no, 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 you cannot publish this because it doesn't have a mark of authenticity. Okay, it's like uh, authenticity may be a mark like what we have for trustworthiness, because you remember that at the beginning when we were buying it on eBay, there were a lot of scams. And now we have stars, we have points, uh, you know, now there is a system to differentiate between the scammers and, uh, you know, the trustworthy people or groups. And uh, this person will say, could you do the same for, uh, you know, uh, scientific information? Certainly we could do the same by, uh, you know, putting a tag about the top journals, the journals that really, you know, have a good referee process, et cetera, et cetera. That could be some tag that we could put to use, for example, because people cannot normally distinguish, you know, between the Lancet and the minor medical journal. They take what they like. So I think that some sort of control, quality control over the information, and then people can look at the horrible information they want, but there may be, uh, I think it would be nice to have some sort of tag, some sort of control about this information comes from a highly regarded control uh, journal, for example. Then people can disregard it, but it would be nice to have something like that. Great, we have one more question. You said in relation to the work by Erickson et al. 2015, that you would not associate common with moral as they do, but with appropriate. What is at stake in this distinction between moral and appropriate or acceptable? Well, uh, uh, you know, uh, being uh, a philosopher by training, the philosopher of science, not a moral philosopher, but uh, you know, basically, what I think as a moral, moral behavior with a big M is a socially independent behavior, okay? Is behavior that you would perform whether other people do or don't do it, approve or disapprove, etc. And there are few very true moral behaviors. Most of what we call moral behavior are social norms, basically. Okay, and so my distinction when they say the common is moral, what they show in their experiment is not that it's moral in any uh, super sense, but uh, they use moral as appropriate, acceptable, okay, agreed upon is okay. And that's why I don't want to call it moral because I reserve moral for, you know, really independent behaviors. That's why. Fantastic. Um, I don't see any new questions. Yes. Okay. Good. That's okay. Well, we've um, we've given Christina a good hour and a half there, and it's. I always say this on these occasions. Or I have been doing. It's really hard to stay focused on a screen when you're the presenter for an hour and a half. Um, but I've certainly enjoyed the presentation. I think we got some very interesting questions there from people. So. Thanks to everybody for attending the event here on Zoom with us. Um, thanks for the questions. Um, but most of all, uh, thanks to Christina. Um, we were hoping to be able to entertain you in person. <laughs> um, it would have been great and hopefully we can perhaps do that at some point in the, the future. But um, thank you very much, Christina, for speaking to us today in such a stimulating way. Um, it's been really terrific. And I'd just like to invite everybody um, to join us next week for our final Zoom lecture of the semester. That's on Tuesday, December the 8th. And that will be with uh, Barrett Richmond from Duke University. And he's going to be speaking about stateless commerce. So thanks again to Christina. Uh, thanks to you and have a very good evening or afternoon wherever you are in the, in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christine. Uh, have a nice evening, I guess. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.